Okay, so uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of you uh, for coming here today. And uh, I, I've seen many uh, familiar and unfamiliar faces, and I'm really hoping that uh, we'll get to know each other over the course of uh, this project. And uh, uh, we will have uh, a seminar uh, on the topic of faith, uh, science, faith, and religion uh, running uh, this fall and uh, next spring. So, and we have uh, plenty of exciting uh, lecturers, great lecturers uh, lined up. Uh, this is meant to be uh, uh, my introductory uh, lecture into the topics that I hope we will cover over the course of uh, uh, this project and the, this seminar. Uh, so yes, first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing I would like uh, to thank our funders, Ian Ramsey's Center for Science and Religion and Templeton Foundation uh, for being uh, so kind and deciding to fund our project. So uh, that's really wonderful. Without them, this wouldn't have been possible. Now, as you can see, uh, our topic is science, faith and religion. But what we are going to do in uh, this seminar and uh, as a part of the larger project is to focus on two historical periods uh, that are very important, uh, late antiquity and early modern period. So that's roughly our historical focus. Uh, but our goal with that uh, is to try to figure out uh, the implications our historical studies of science, religion, and superstition have for our contemporary modern view of what science is, what religion is, uh, what superstition is, and the relations between them. So that's the hope that by the end of this uh, project, by the end of this seminar, we will have a better view of what we are dealing with today, what we are talking about when, when we are talking about religion, when we are talking about science or scientific method or faith or uh, uh, or superstition for that matter. So that's our hope. Now, today, before uh, uh, experts uh, uh, in these respective periods show up and start talking about how religion uh, science or superstition uh, were uh, thought in these periods, thought about, considered to be in these periods, I, I want to say something about uh, the received view of what science and religion are today. Uh, and uh, somehow in that way motivate uh, our historical approach to these concepts. Uh, so, here is uh, here here these two uh, little uh, pictures uh, summarize uh, basically uh, how we usually approach uh, religion and science uh, uh, today. Uh, and um, uh, on the one uh, hand, uh, that's the first the left picture: religion versus science. Religion and science are uh, seen as fighting over the proper worldview. Uh, and in this fight, somehow they are in confrontation all the time. Scientific explanations are competing with the religious worldviews. And uh, science is somehow always winning. And religion is always somehow on defense and uh, bordering superstition. So that's one way of seeing uh, the relationship between two. The other also popular way uh, to approach science and religion is to treat them as complementary and to argue that no, they're not in any kind of fight. Uh, they cover different fields. Uh, science is there for us to help us explain natural phenomena um, uh, to give us insight into uh, how the nature works and in that way help us uh, overcome our uh, natural uh, limits 
um, to help us with technology, how to heal diseases, uh, to extend our life, and so on. It make our life in general easier. Okay. Meanwhile, fate uh, is uh, nothing to do with that. Fate is there to give us meaning, to provide our lives with meaning uh, and values, uh, to give us insight into what's good and what's bad. So this, these values are never to be mixed with the state of affairs, natural world, science is dealing with natural world, fate is dealing with our values. And they are complementary. We, we as human beings need them both. Now, in one wonderful book, Peter Harrison, uh, Territories of Science and Religion, uh, and I warmly recommend that book, he uh, rightly so argued that the concept of science and religion, the way we understand them today, is not something uh, that was given to us forever. Uh, the science and religion uh, understood this way are not some kind of natural kinds and persistent over all times. What we think uh, about science and religion and the very concepts of science and religion uh, uh, went many changes, they didn't even exist if we go further back in history. And the way we understand them today uh, has been shaped more or less in the last 200 years, starting, well, it started a little, uh, uh, a little bit earlier, 17th century, 16th century, but in the last 200 years, they got the shape that we deal with today. Okay, uh, so I'll start with the left sign uh, and uh, say more about religion versus science when we perceive them as being in a uh, fight uh, and in which science is always winning. And I'll start with one uh, story. And that's my favorite story uh, because what you see here on the picture uh, is my high school. Uh, and two top windows uh, to, the uh, to the right on the second floor there uh, is my classroom. And I spent four years of high school in that classroom over there uh, in the late 80s. Uh, here in Belgrade, uh, during socialism, these were the last days of socialism, but still it was socialism back here. Uh, and one day uh, in the third grade, if I'm not mistaken, um, a professor of logic uh, came to the class and she asked, why do you think people believe in God? Now, of course, the question was met with a silence and uh, uh, people didn't know what to say. And one student finally said, well, people believe in God when they don't have a proper scientific explanation for the world, for things that are happening in the world, for events that they perceive as important. So they believe in God when they don't have that. And our teacher said, nonsense, that's not why people believe in God. And she continued uh, to explain, well, our natures are finite and the belief in God uh, fulfills our other needs and so on and so forth. But the rest is less interesting as the very answer. Uh, at the time, I thought about it a lot. And uh, I was thinking uh, that uh, that was basically Marxism ideology of uh, Marxism that was uh, getting that shape in uh, when it comes to uh, God. And uh, I, I didn't really think uh, more about that. I thought it was just Marxism and me being raised in socialism. Uh, that such a view of religion was not really popular elsewhere. Now, soon I learned that that was not the case, that Marx was only one of them, and Marxists were only one kind of atheists to believe in that story, that uh, we need God or uh, believe in God when we lack proper scientific explanation. There are other people who also shared that view in the 19th century, and not only Marxists or Marx, but plenty of various ideologically different uh, intellectuals 
shared that view of religion and science. So, so one of them, the, the, the one in the middle here, uh, is August Comte. Uh, he is uh, the father of positivism, uh, for example, entirely different from Marx. Uh, the third guy here uh, is uh, Sir James George Fraser. Uh, he was an anthropologist and he studied uh, world re religions a lot and we'll come back to him. But all of them somehow shared this same view that uh, somehow religion and science are competing for the proper explanation of the world, which is which is really sort of weird. Yeah. Uh, now, here is what Comte had, uh, August Comte, uh, Comte had in mind. Uh, he believed that uh, human beings uh, in their history uh, went through several stages until they reached the modern one, um, uh, this modern period. Uh, and these three several stages uh, are different st stages of the way human beings e explained phenomena in nature. So the first stage was religious. And according to Kant, uh, in this first stage, human beings ascribed certain powers uh, to personal forces, uh, supernatural forces or uh, some extraordinary forces who could make things happen in this world. In the second stage, philosophical stage, we move from these personal forces, gods, demons, spirits, you name it, to uh, more abstract uh, concepts such as first causes, monads. Um, they're still somehow transcendental on the other side of this world and they're supposed to explain the happenings in this world. And finally, in the last, uh, more on the most advanced stage we have uh, the, that scientific stage we reach the uh, we reach the uh, proper explanation and of the world we reach scientific explanations of the world uh, science has its own methodology uh, ways to investigate nature and through investigating nature we start to understand the natural laws and all of that plays a role in our understanding of natural phenomena. So that's the most advanced stage in which we live. Uh, that's the argument, okay. Now, similar thing uh, can be found in uh, James George Frazier. Uh, he's famous, uh, it, when you see, when you take a look at these uh, books here, that's his, the Golden Bow book. And uh, in that book, he described many world religions. Now, he studied them all. Uh, and uh, he uh, tried to track down similarities between these religions. Uh, and what he noticed is uh, that in many religions, not only in Christianity, but in many religions, uh, religious rituals are tied to seasonal changes. Uh, that in many religions, uh, they believe that some high, kind of rebirth comes after death, that a uh, young king needs to be sacrificed for the sake of uh, his descendants. So that's not only uh, a matter of Christianity, so it's found everywhere pretty much. But the thing that he really, really uh, believed too, and that's what he has in common with Kant and even Marx, is that we need somehow to move on from uh, uh, superstition uh, by developing these scientific explanations. Uh, and once we do that, we are leaving this superstitious past, past behind us. Now, he also believed that in the first human communities, um, human beings, uh, ascribed special powers to some extraordinary uh, individuals in their community, like shamans, chiefs. So when something goes wrong, some somebody gets sick, for example, so, or, or the fire gets started somewhere, or uh, there is a flood, 
uh, they believed that uh, these special ind individuals can actually intervene with supernatural powers and make these things go away. Uh, so make our lives better. Uh, from this early period uh, into another uh, uh, next period, uh, which is the period of uh, world religions, uh, the same power uh, to help us out is ascribed to gods. And it's on us human beings to do uh, special sacrifices, to plea, to pray to gods, to help us out. And if we do that properly, uh, the belief is uh, our pain uh, and suffering in this world will be relieved. Finally, in the most advanced stage in human history, uh, we understand that there are no personal uh, forces to plead to, that there are not, no gods to pray to, that, that natural forces are uh, deaf, that they don't care about us, uh, that they cannot be uh, plead for anything. Uh, but the good side is that if we find out what these natural forces are, we can actually use them uh, for our purpose. And that's where uh, the name uh, Francis Bacon uh, comes to mind. And we'll talk about Francis Bacon uh, a little bit later. But uh, that's the view of Francis Bacon. So if we know the powers that, uh, that, that uh, operate in this world, we can use them to our own advantage. Okay, now, this all leads to, naturally leads to these uh, famous four horsemen of the new atheism, and we all know them. Uh, they all believe that religion is nothing but the superstition, that scientific view is something that is far more advantageous, that science is the future, religion as superstition is the past, and we know them, it's uh, Dawkins and Hitchison and Harris and Dennett, uh, and they uh, they are somehow the faces of what, what well, uh, let me say, not may maybe most people, but many people, even common people, um, fairly educated, uh, like to believe today. Now, of course, the question is, is this the right way to think about religion? Uh, do we want to think about religion as the kind of explanation of the world that is in comp competition with the worldly, ex uh, with the scientific uh, explanation of the world? Um, and something is off with, with this kind of take. I mean, if we go back in history uh, and uh, try to uh, make a survey of the scientific theories, theories about the world, uh, that we abandoned along the way, uh, we find many dead theories. Uh, we find Galen's theory uh, of humors, for humors, uh, Galen's theory of disease uh, as uh, the imbalance of these humors. Uh, we find the, the one that philosophers really like is the uh, concept of uh, theory of phlogiston. Phlogiston was the a uh, special material uh, that was to account for uh, the heating things. So uh, when uh, things burn, that means that phlogiston is leaving uh, leaving uh, 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 those things. So that it's, it's just the explanation of the combustion and the heat that we also uh, left along the way. But none of these theories have anything to do um, with uh, religion. So that's something to think about when we think about this uh, mainstream view of religion as a false kind of explanation of, of, uh, of nature. So let's leave that open for now. The other thing that we want to ask is, uh, why do we think about it? How come that we ended up thinking about religion in this kind of doctrinal way? We have a, a body of beliefs, uh, that fail to account for how the world stands or what for what is happening in the world. So is, is that view that we could find in the 10th century or among ancient Greece, uh, Greeks? So it's just 
the question how uh, recent this view of religion as the body of knowledge in competition with scientific knowledge, uh, 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 how old is it? Or uh, when did it begin? And of course, the answer is that's fairly recent. And no, uh, we never had this view of religion uh, that these four horsemen of new atheism share now, and many people will be done. Uh, and not only religion, but if we go back in time, uh, the concept of knowledge was never about proper explanation of events. If we go back to Plato, Aristotle, Stoic, St. Augustine, all of those people in the ancient period, we can see that for them, knowledge of the eternal truths, knowledge of the transient, uh, corruptible truths uh, of this world, the knowledge of it is in the service of a good life, good moral life. It's more like a skill to live good than uh, like a theory that will explain certain phenomena and make us, help us uh, build a steam machine, for example. So knowledge, wisdom, in other words, was something that we acquire for the sake of good life. Okay, so that's radically different from August Kant or Marx. And if we follow uh, uh, Peter Harrison in his book, Science, uh, The Territories of Science and Religion, wonderful book, as I said, um, we can see uh, that, uh, if, and if we try to trace back uh, the concept of religion, uh, we can go uh, all the way to St. Aquinas, to the 13th century, and see the concept of religio, uh, not so much understood as a body of knowledge or a doctrine, so much as a virtue of the soul. So it's not set of beliefs, it's the virtue of the soul. Uh, and uh, of course, being Aristotelian, Saint Aquinas tells us that religio is a proper way of worshiping God and it stands in, in between two uh, 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 not so good things, um, superstition and uh, two vices, superstition and irreligion, atheism basically. Now, even if we go back further uh, uh people may ask well but didn't uh, uh pagans or and early christians debated uh, doctrines uh, didn't uh, early christians among themselves debated about what the right doctrine is and the thing is if we look at their debates we can see that their debates were not so much about the correct worldview as much as about correct way of worshiping god and so correct way of worshiping and correct object of the worship, okay? So that's an interesting and different uh, thing to what we think of religion and science today. We more think about them as body of knowledge or some kind of doctrine that then we evaluate. Uh, for Jeremy, uh, one of the first early Christians, uh, he thought, that uh, the proper way of worship is to uh, uh, show charity uh, and do good deeds. And uh, the way pagans do that is the wrong way to do it. And that's superstition. And, and what pagans did, they sacrificed. They, they had their rituals of sac uh, sacrifices uh, to diamonds, which for Christians were demons. So they they actually argued about that and they said, well, you won't so, uh, save your soul if you're continuing with these kind of sacrifices, you're not worshiping God, uh, God well. St. Augustine, uh, and this is from Harrison book and he quotes St. Augustine there. He says um, that Augustine also thought that the, the, the issue is about the right uh, kind of worship. Uh, and that's true religion, when we worship in a proper way one true God. And that's what pagans did not do it. They worshipped false gods 
and uh, wicked demons and they engage in its sacrifices and that's all wrong. Now, to be fair, uh, St. Augustine uh, thought that uh, uh, truly re religion, true kinds of worship always existed, that God always found a way to, uh, to lead us uh, even before Christ. So among uh, uh, in the period uh, before Christ, among uh, pagan pagans, we find people who knew how to worship God properly, uh, who were truly religious. And he also believed that uh, some Catholics of his day, despite being officially Christian, are not really doing it right. So they are superstitious. Um, in any case, this view of religion, if as something that comes from inside, so some propensity of our soul uh, that we do, uh, and that uh, eventually uh, gives us the way to reach God, um, started slowly changing as of 16th century, uh, and religion started to be uh, treated more as a doctrine outside of us to be evaluated. Okay, uh, why that happened? I'm really hoping that to be able to uh, uncover more details and more factors uh, that contributed to this change from inner disposition to something external uh, during this, uh, uh, this series of lectures. Uh, the usual suspects, the usual suspects of factors are printing press, reformation, natural philosophy, and I'm hoping that in the following lectures we'll be talking about uh, those more. As for science, the same thing happened. Uh, again, if we follow Harrison in his short history of science, uh, and go back to St. Aquinas, we can see that uh, for St. Aquinas, scientia, was not a body of knowledge. It was intellectual virtue. And this intellectual virtue uh, is, uh, is, uh, helps us uh, to discern uh, proper arguments, to follow demonstrations, to detect what's right, what's wrong. Uh, now, being intellectual virtue, uh, it's tied to religious virtue as well, virtues as well, to faith, love, and uh, hope. And if we don't have religious virtues, we are prone to go to fall into sin. And sin is something that can cloud our judgment. Now, uh, uh, so, so they are closely tied together. Now, the same thing that happened to religio happened to scientia. So it's slowly uh, from this inner uh, disposition, from this psychological dimension, turned slowly into set of methods, theories, explanations that are outside of us, uh, that can uh, that we can use to improve the way we live and so on, but they are not really tied to improvement of our soul anymore. Now, science also uh, became a body of knowledge to be evaluated. And in this transition from either in disposition to body of knowledge, uh, in both religion and science, uh, we came to that that in that uh, when they started being compared, religion lost. Well, we live in the time when we usually, if we take this framework seriously, religion is the one uh, on the losing side always. Okay, fine. Why did that happen? What I'm going to say now, to say in a couple of words, uh, is uh, the official story. The, the story that we can usually find in textbooks that are repeated in the newspapers, blogs, and so on, that uh, is somehow received knowledge, even though this official story, why and how science won over religion, uh, is uh, challenged and has been challenged many times by serious historians in many, many ways. Nonetheless, it somehow sticks and it's repeated and it's found pretty much, uh, it can be found anywhere. Now, this is how the story goes. Uh, in this period from the 15th and to, uh, 17th century, uh, many things changed in the way Europeans lived uh, and uh, what Europeans did. 
Uh, so uh, in their travels, they discovered in faraway lands, all of a sudden, that there are many plants and animals that uh, Aristotle never described in his writings. Also, uh, they discovered uh, many technological advancements. Uh, well, they made them uh, on the way, uh, such as printing press, uh, such as a telescope, uh, the, the most more primitive microscope, and so on and so forth. Many social changes that uh, happened. Protestantism, for example. So the break within the Western Catholic Church uh, took place in this period. And uh, in all of this turmoil, uh, mechanistic, the view of universe as something disenchanted and mechanistic was born. Uh, and in this official story, How Science Won, this disenchanted universe is somehow uh, the main reason why uh, science won and why we had technological progress uh, uncomparable to anything before uh, the modern period. Now, many stories go back to Francis Bacon. Uh, so uh, let's see two themes in uh, Francis Bacon, the philosopher uh, of the 17th century, who wrote New Organon and who wrote New Atlantis, wonderful books. I warmly recommend them uh, with many interesting ideas there. But two themes are somehow the most important for this uh, mechanistic universe to win. And uh, as the argument goes, for the industrial re revolution that followed. Okay, so the first one is that uh, is uh, the idea that uh, explaining uh, our world uh, in uh, by relying uh, on four causes, and that was a custom. Uh, Aristotle had these four causes, and he thought. Uh, that th these causes, these four causes, can explain uh, the world. Uh, well, as of Bacon and on, uh, out of these four causes, only one survives as the legitimate uh, cause and as a, the legitimate part of any explanation. Okay, so it becomes the cornerstone of every proper scientific explanation. Well, that's at least the argument. Um, you can see here uh, what these four causes are, and uh, if you don't know them, just just a uh, quick reminder. Uh, one of them uh, is material cause. That's the stuff that the thing is made of, anything. So that's the the stuff we uh, that the, the tables, uh, rocks, human beings are made of. Um, the formal cause uh, usually translates into what makes that thing that thing so the essence of the thing what makes a table table that's basically a formal cause efficient cause are all the powers that bring together a thing um, in this case all the forces that the carpenter is using to put the table together and the final cause is uh, the purpose of the thing and this is obviously dining table uh, and the first cause of Aristotelian four causes to uh, slip is the final cause. And we can find in, in New Organon the critic, uh, criticism of final cause as uh, something if we ascribe final causes to natural phenomena, we are anthropoph anthropomorphizing nature. So we don't want to do it. We don't need final causes in, na in nature. Now, to be fair, Bacon does talk about formal causes and material causes, but he reformulates them in a way that they can be reduced to efficient cause. <sighs> For example, for the formal cause, he says, well, it's a sort of law, law of nature that makes things that uh, a particular thing, that thing, that these are the conditions that need to obtain, that something happens. So it's really a um, substantial diversion from what Aristotle thought. Okay, so, but eventually people start talking about material causes, formal causes, final causes, only the efficient cause left. The other thing, very interesting, uh, from um, uh, Bacon uh, is his famous claim that the knowledge is power. Uh, what that meant uh, was that he thought, okay, if we figure out 
uh, laws of nature. Uh, if we figure out the conditions under which certain phenomena appear, we will be able to improve our lives immensely. Uh, we can make things that we need by making the conditions that will produce them. And if we do that, many of our problems will be solved. So uh, he wrote this wonderful book. It's not finished, uh, but I still uh, really recommend it, uh, where he describes ut utopian uh, society, uh, that's New Atlantis, uh, uh, and the life of uh, its inhabitants. So the people in New Atlantis, they are Christians, okay? So they have their own uh, uh, morals. But the most important thing about New Atlantis uh, is uh, the uh, uh, group of scientists there. They, they, they have their society and they study nature and its laws all the time. They study uh, nature, uh, they study phenomena related to agriculture, to medicine. So when you go to New Atlantis, when you find yourself there, all of a sudden there is no hunger, there is no sickness. And even if there is sickness, uh, they can cure it. Uh, so uh, he envisioned uh, uh, society uh, uh, like ours, well, in some sense, like ours, uh, more advanced definitely than something in his time uh, with uh, many things that help us, help our lives be easier for us. Long, healthy, easier lives with no hunger, no sickness, uh, and in some uh, nice relations. So no poverty, not, none of that. So this idea knowledge is power combined with this efficient cause that survived combined uh, give us, arguably, that's the official story, industrial revolution. So all of a sudden, uh, in the next uh, 300 years, uh, we find the uh, steam engine, we make the steam engine, we make electricity, we end up having computers, we end up having antibiotics, all of the luxuries of modern life. So the argument then is the scientific method that Bacon argued for the close study of nature, crucial experiment, and so on, gave us uh, this uh, modernity that we really like. It's easy life in comparison to anything in the past. What was the role of humanities or religion in that? Well, nothing, not none. That's the story. Uh, religion did not contribute anything, humanities or some study of that text, no, no, it's not study of nature, so they are not helping us there. Uh, religion also, uh, uh, so either they are outside of it, uh, they didn't contribute anything uh, to this progress, or at worst, they tried to prevent it. And the famous story, uh, the most popular story among, uh, among uh, uh, atheists, is, well, look, the Catholic Church burned the Giordano Bruno, and that's the famous example that they really, really uh, push for in every textbook uh, in, uh, that they write. So uh, religion already is losing there, okay, according to this story. Now, as I said, many people uh, challenge this view. Uh, and try to, uh, by careful historical studies, uh, make a proper link between uh, uh, church, religion, scientific discoveries. And uh, in uh, uh, this wonderful book that uh, was co-edited by uh, John Milbank and Peter Harrison, uh, we have all kinds of ways in which uh, religion and science intervened to produce this modernity. And uh, one of the articles there is Milbank's that I really recommend. Uh, he's arguing there that, uh, that uh, enchanted universe, so not this mechanistic dead universe of efficient causation was always present 
uh, and proposed by many scholars of the time, but was somehow forgotten or put aside. And he puts the argument uh, for th that uh, alternative modernity, modernity within enchanted universe is still possible. Uh, and uh, that we can still kind of go that way. Um, and that it was possible back then. I agree with him, with him that uh, our technological progress uh, could have been made possible within different metaphysics, not this uh, mechanistic universe of efficient causation. But that's something, again, to leave open and to try to address uh, during uh, our lectures and uh, this term and next term. So let's keep mind open that we can re, re, uh, we can make more discoveries toward uh, uh, about this. Okay, now, uh, so this is uh, what we got so far. Uh, uh, this official story of how science won uh, uh, tells us that uh, religion, uh, we overcame religion as the false explanation of natural phenomena uh, that we have to leave it behind us as superstition. And uh, that's basically what new atheists are arguing in a nutshell. Now, let's move back at the top uh, and see uh, the other view of the relationship between science and religion that is far more uh, sympathetic to the faith side. Um, uh, according to which uh, uh, science and religion uh, occupy two different fields and satisfy two different needs uh, of human beings. Uh, science is there to give us explanation of the world, uh, to uh, may, uh, help us predict uh, what's going to happen, uh, to help us develop advanced technologies, and so on and so forth, to help us live our lives easier uh, the way Bacon envisioned. But faith on the other side is there to help us, uh, uh, help us uh, somehow find the meaning in our lives, uh, to navigate our lives uh, uh, between good and bad, uh, ugly and beautiful, so to give us values and meaning. Uh, so their goals are entirely different. They do not overlap. They are not in competition. They have their own spheres, both of them necessary for us human beings. This view uh, 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 was argued by Wittgenstein. He never really developed his philosophy of uh, religion because he, uh, as we all know, could not finish anything that he started writing. Uh, but but uh, from his comments from culture and value, we can uh, we can find comments about uh, religion, and uh, from there we can compose this as his view. Uh, other people also. Uh, philosophers also embraced it. So uh, Wittgensteinians like uh, D.Z. Phillips, uh, but also uh, scientists like uh, 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 like uh, J.J. Gould, biologists. So it's a it's not unpopular view. Now, for Wittgenstein, uh, uh, it's interesting because he. Uh, in the same way, he insisted in his philosophical investigations uh, that not all words refer uh, to objects or not pro all propositions describe possible state of affairs. In the same way, he had this insight that our approach and attitude toward nature cannot be reduced to the need to explain it. We go and face the nature to be in aid to experience wonder, uh, to hear God, after all. None of that can be reduced to the need to explain things. That, that's only one of the functions, one of the ways to approach nature. Uh, but it doesn't exhaust all of it, all of our needs. Similar thing uh, Tolstoy in his confession noticed. Uh, he uh, also, uh, and he shared uh, this uh, Wittgenstein 
uh, Wittgenstein take, and uh, uh, we can, uh, and since Wittgenstein read Tolstoy and really, really respected him, so it's probably the day to uh, kind of uh, that he too saw it there and embraced his view. Um, Tolstoy, in his confession, uh, also thought, uh, also argued that uh, science and religion are two separate. Uh, fields and needs, and uh, they shouldn't overlap. So this is a very nice quote, uh, and he says that the task of experimental science is to determine the causal sequence of material phenomena. If experimental science should run into a question concerning an ultimate cause, it stumbles over nonsense. So Tolstoy is aware, well, if, if, ex if science wants to give us answer to the ultimate questions about God or meaning of life, uh, it can give us nothing. Uh, for Wittgenstein, uh, and that's interesting and something to think about and explore further uh, during uh, our studies, um, is uh, for Wittgenstein, superstition uh, happens when uh, uh, a person who is a, a believer uh, tries to arrange some things for him or for her in this world via plea, uh, 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 via prayer to God. Uh, and he says religious faith and superstition are entirely different. One of them springs from fear and is a kind of false science. What this means is basically that, uh, uh, that when we don't trust God's will, uh, when we uh, don't put our destiny into God's hands, uh, we pray to him to give us something particular in this world, to interfere and intervene in this world to help us out. Uh, if we trust in God's will, we won't ask for particular things. But when we do, we fall into superstition. That's what Wittgenstein thought. Uh, and that's kind of false science, pseudoscience that we try to do. We want to arrange something for us in this world by appealing to God and asking him to arrange that for us. So in, if somebody gets sick and prays for uh, getting well, well, that's sort of superstition uh, for Wittgenstein. Now, now, this is all nice and well and uh, with good intentions to uh, differentiate these two fields of science and, uh, and religion and to save uh, religious people uh, from the accusation to, uh, of being superstitious. Um, so somebody can say, well, this is the price we pay. But the thing with this view of superstition as uh, uh, and seeing petitionary prayer uh, as superstitious um, does not fit well with uh, how uh, 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 desert fathers in early uh, Christian communities uh, uh, thought about prayer. Uh, and if we go back in time, and that's why it's important to go back in time, uh, people like John and Barsanufius, uh, these are the monks of uh, Holy Fathers of uh, the sixth century Gaza. Uh, if we read through their letters, we see that they, of course, approved uh, uh, petitionary prayer, but they are very well, uh, well aware that natural remedies, uh, doctors can do their thing, but we can still pray to God to help us out. Uh, and that that's not superstition. And I hope that these kind of historical dives can help us illuminate what science, superstition, and religion uh, are today. And the final thing, uh, is that no matter how appealing we find this Wittgensteinian take that leaves the space for faith in our ordinary lives, uh, the thing is that by confining faith to this rel uh, realm of values um, that has nothing to do to, with the world or the uh, physics or biology or this world, um, somehow puts the whole uh, religion on defensive, so uh, it accommodates fate to this new scientific worldview that we take for granted. And my question then is, do we really need to take for granted this uh, rather uh, mechanistic 
reductive uh, dead universe as something that West sciences are telling us. Maybe we should challenge that. So that's my hope for this course too. So no, to, to see whether this view, scientific view is not maybe scientism, not science. Um, and I will sort of wrap it up for today. Uh, what I want to say at the end is that I hope that you will join us for our next talk uh, that will take place on uh, September 29th. Professor Steve Fuller is going to talk about religion and science too. So uh, it will uh, also be a, a philosophical uh, approach to these uh, issues. Uh, and um, uh, what else? I wanted to uh, also to say that um, even though I love uh, questions at the end of the lecture, uh, today I was thinking to make the exception, um, not because I don't like questions, I do really like them, but uh, to have this as an opening, to, uh, to think about questions that we want to uh, get answered during this uh, seminar uh, and during this project, and then to get together at the end of the series of lectures that we'll have this fall and next uh, uh, next uh, spring. And then for the final lecture, to kind of collect all these questions and try to see what we learned. So, um, so that's how I would like to end today. And uh, I, have, uh, I have the final thought here, uh, which says, thank you. So I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, and I hope you did hear me, okay? Um, so, shall we go now? Um, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, if anybody, anybody have a question, you can raise a hand and then we will... Uh, 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 yes, yes, yes. Please, please, go, go, go with the questions. It's just that I might not have the answers as yet. So that was my... Uh, <laughs> but my, yes, should, should. Uh, well, um, I do. Uh, can I be heard? Uh, yes. My question is only is really uh, to you, with the request that uh, you went rather quickly in this fascinating presentation. I would greatly appreciate it if you could provide the references, the precise references to what you cited and presented on the screens. Oh yeah. Okay. okay. Origins. Uh I mean, uh, either uh, subsequently in emails to those of us who, uh, well, that might be the easiest. Just, okay. just uh, in in emails, you know, slides such and such. This is where Wittgenstein made this comment. This is where John and of the sixth century Gaza had made those comments. Oh, I find that very, very helpful in following up uh, what you had said. Absolutely, I'll combine all the references uh, and some more. I, I'm going to put them together, uh, and we'll find uh, and we'll send you either email, uh, uh, and I'll post the link. I don't know how you but on on, uh, and we'll post it on the website. So, but but to do it lecture by lecture. In other words, yes. specifically for this lecture, okay. for and this then for lecture, the subsequent no one. Uh, it will be up uh, tomorrow. Or the day after the latest. And the website, uh, uh, could you send us the link to the website uh, uh, by email? Okay. Yes. Um, uh, we'll send the link for the website and uh, for the references, we'll have it there. So uh, thank you very much, Ernest. Uh, uh, and expect that two days the latest. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Now, Mr. Stern. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm puzzled, uh, not by you in particular, but in general, I'm puzzled by the banishment of final causes uh -huh. in in science. I used to teach analytical mechanics, and I used to tell my students, unless you are willing to fully embrace final causes, until unless you are willing to think about what the particle of or the spin top is willing to do or, or, mm -hmm. or has to do in order to minimize action or this or that, you never understand 
uh, analytical mechanics. And if you don't understand analytical mechanics, you never understand uh, more advanced stuff. So uh, for some reason, although in the practice or in the theory of modern science, we fully use uh, uh, teleological reasoning uh, when it comes to discussing the relation between between science and and religion, we we go back to insisting now no, no, we can only use we can only think about uh, about efficient causes. What's really out of of out of kilter me out of kilter me with modern science. So I would. You know what? That's a wonderful comment, and thank you very much. Uh, uh, the thing is that uh, uh, this is what philosophers like to believe, uh, and uh, usually they give these simplified stories of what's going on in science. But when you look in the sciences, like concrete science, like biology, or like, you find all these causes around. Uh, it's not that. Um, this is what philosophers like to do. They like to think that only one certain cause exists, that this is what our sciences tell us, but they don't really look in what's going on in sciences uh, carefully. Or when they do, they cherry pick and they try to say, well, look, we can reduce everything else to this. So uh, uh, what I presented is basically the simplest and I really believe the wrong kind of story uh, that philosophers for some reason like because they like reductionism, but that's my take. And I really uh, hope that uh, in this uh, series of lectures, uh, we'll see uh, that there are far more problems with this simplified picture uh, than, uh, than we like to admit. Uh, or at least that philosophers like to admit. So thank you very much. I agree with you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Okay, great. Wonderful. Thank you all for coming and stay tuned. And uh, we'll have all the references posted on the websites and send it uh, to everyone. Um, so yeah. So we are ending for today and bye-bye. Uh, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank bye, you. bye. Have a nice day. Bye. You too. <laughs> you too. Yeah.